Good morning, everyone. Ron Spomer here with another episode of RSO Podcast. I'm going to read a story today about a moose adventure that I enjoyed up in Alaska many years ago. I found an old American Hunter magazine in which my story appeared in August of 1996. So I imagine the hunt occurred in 95, maybe 94. And, oh, I remember it was a wild, wild adventure. Sort of in the south end of the Wrangells, uh, the Wrangell Mountain Ranges. It's just a glorious snow-covered mountain range in Alaska. And the, uh, well, you can see the picture if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're just listening to the podcast, use your imagination. There's this big bull moose with his nose up in the air, lip curling, looking for a cow. And he's got big antlers. That's what we love about moose hunting, I think, is the, the big wilderness, the big experience, and then an animal with huge antlers, just so spectacular. Nobody cannot admire a big bull moose. So it says here, the moose that disappeared is the title, and it uh, has a little caption line underneath this picture that says, could a half-ton bull with antlers five feet wide all but vanish in a spruce forest? The author learns that anything is possible in the Alaska wilderness. All right, let's dive right in. He's gone. Stryker whispered. What do you mean he's gone? A thousand pound moose doesn't just disappear. I saw him bed down. Why would he why would he suddenly get up and leave? I argued, but quietly. Well, he might have heard us crossing that draw. The wind might have swirled. Well, I'm old enough to know that I don't know as much as I like to think I know, but I knew that that moose was still there, exactly where I'd seen it bed a half hour before but I couldn't convince my guide of that, and his confidence was beginning to shake mine. Let's go back, Stryker advised. We'll find him in the morning. He won't have gone far. Well, yes, I thought. He won't go far because he's still lying right where I saw him. But, of course, I didn't say that to Stryker because, and this is another thing I've lived long enough to know, you don't question a hunting guide's woodsmanship. Nevertheless, it bothered me to think of turning back after we'd gotten so close. That huge bull couldn't have been more than 200 yards away, maybe only a 100. Well, to Stryker's credit, we had tried hard to relocate that beast, looking for the dead-topped spruce that we'd selected as a marker, trying to line up the tree from which we'd last seen it. Moving back and forth and side to side as far as we could without making too much noise, or risking the quartering wind. It was getting late, our gear was still loaded on the pack horses, and this was the first day of the hunt. But still, I think we ought to move further to the right, I suggested one last time. But Stryker was already turning to walk back. He didn't want to risk moving farther into the bull's territory, stinking it up, and possibly spooking our quarry worse than we'd already done. As far as he was concerned, this moose hunt or uh, this moose had given us the slip. You've heard how dumb moose are, haven't you? Sure, bullwinkle and all that. Well, I don't suppose they'll win any Rhodes scholarships, but listen, that bulbous nose isn't just cosmetic. And atop that dim bulb head are a pair of radar ears constantly swiveling. Stryker overly knew that. He's an Alaska native. He grew up working for his old man, Terry, who himself has been hunting, guiding, and living in the Alaska bush since he was just 16. Stryker has already spotted, stalked, shot, pointed out, jumped, nudged, herded, butchered, and passed up more moose than I've ever seen. But this was my moose, one I'd located, and I knew in my bones, despite my guide's superior experience, that bull was still lying in its bed. I just knew it. No animal lowers a half ton to the ground unless he plans on resting it there for a while. Turning back at that point wouldn't have been the ruin of the hunt, but it might have been the end of my chance to shoot a bull. We had just two days to hunt. This moose adventure was an adjunct to a doll sheep hunt, which I'd concluded two days earlier by hanging a splendid 41-inch ram in the meat shed. After a day's rest, we'd ridden from the lodge under high, thin clouds past showy poplars contrasting dark spruces and old prospectors' cabins rotting back to the soil. 
Our horses drank deeply at several icy streams, the ripples from their noses in the current flashing shadows like fleeing trout over submerged cobblestones. We rode quietly to the sounds of leather, the knock of a pannier box against a sapling, the brush of dwarf birch against a leg. Autumn was blazing above the tree line, and when we broke from the spruce forest, the taiga rolled away like autumn harvest, a carpet of auburn, russet, yellow, and orange punctuated by spruces standing like dark exclamation points. Proud caribou bulls pranced across our front as we rode. To the west and south, dark flanks of the Wrangell Mountains climbed above the color, dark rocks sitting heavily on the earth, then bursting into brilliant white under a mantle of early snow. Not a road, building, tower, nor power line marred the scene. This was wilderness. This was living the way men won't be able to live much longer. I didn't need to kill a moose to feel that. While we were riding up through the spruce woods, the horses breathing heavily on the steep incline and the trees thinning noticeably, Stryker suddenly reined in and lifted his glasses. Then he threw his right leg back over the saddle, swung down, and signaled me to do the same. Bull, was all he said. Instantly, I realized how unprepared I was. I unsnapped the flap of my scabbard and pulled the rifle free in one quick motion, but I realized my binocular was deep in my backpack, strapped under a mantee on the pack horse. I wondered if I could dig it out without too much trouble, but Stryker was already waving me forward. Here, I said, handing my horse's reins to the apprentice guide and wrangler, Clint. If you get a chance, could you dig my binocular out of my pack? Clint nodded and nudged his horse neatly forward to grab Stryker's reins as well. Damn, I whispered under my breath after my first step. I was wearing nylon rain pants. I donned them for the ride and at the time not expecting to be stalking in them. Oh, they would sound like, like the canvas ripper's guild of Peoria marching through the brush. Again, I looked back at that pack horse, but Stryker was hissing me forward. This wasn't going to work. I tried stepping gingerly, tried weaving between the wiry branches of the dwarf birch, but it was no use. Swish, swish, swish. Fortunately, the moose was at least 400 yards ahead. If it was foraging or chewing cud and the wind was in its ears, eh, it might not hear me. I didn't want it to hear me. I don't mind admitting a younger man is my better, but I don't want him thinking that I'm an incompetent greenhorn either. I could imagine myself trying to explain. Honest, striker, I don't normally hunt in noisy pants. I always wear my binocular when I hunt. Really? <laughs> well, the moose didn't spook. I caught up with striker. He was lying on the ground under a spruce, training his spotting scope on the bull. Is it big enough? I asked. Hmm. I need to turn it. I need it to face me. I don't think so. No. No, the paddles are too small. I took a peek. It was too small, although a novice might have argued the point. I've photographed some huge Alaska moose over the years, and I've looked at more, and I shot a pretty good one that stretched 59 inches. I no longer hyperventilate at the sight of those big canoe paddles. Breathing heavily, yes, but I can control it, and I can make some reasonable comparisons. An Alaska moose is one massive deer, and even a small one makes a dramatic trophy. I wasn't planning to settle for a small one on this short hunt, but I wasn't demanding a giant either. I was being realistic. I wanted a better-than-average antlers, but I also wanted to fly a couple of hundred pounds of lean, tasty moose meat back to Idaho. An hour after passing up that first bull, we were sitting above treeline and glassing down. There were several high spruce basins en route to our spike camp, and there were moose in all of them. The rut was still a few weeks away. Bulls had stripped their velvet, but they hadn't begun to roam. Summer bulls buddy up, and they forage heavily to fuel growth of those heavy palmated racks, moving as little as possible to conserve energy and avoid drawing attention from prowling wolves. For 1,200-pound animals standing over six feet at the shoulder, they can be remarkably hard to see. Bedded, they seem to sink several feet into the cushion of mosses and lichens. Two-foot dwarf birch branches cover the rest of them. Fortunately, many birch leaves had already fallen. That opened our view. 
More importantly, the freshly stripped antlers would gleam white like semaphores. Some biologists suspect that moose antlers are palmated to increase bull visibility to estrus cows. Maybe. They certainly don't need all that bone just to push each other around. Whitetails leave scent to find lovers and elk bugle. Moose grunt and moan. Well, why not wave a flag, too? Let's glass here, Stryker said as evening was coming on. Camp, just three miles further ahead. We'll look for about an hour, and then we'll head in. Well, we'd just passed a small band of caribou that had trotted out toward the open tundra. We turned away from them to search the woods. I think I'll drop down to the lip of that bench to cover different country, I said to Stryker. Clint settled in for a long look, too. Sure, go ahead. Hey, I'll whistle if I find anything. You do the same? Well, it felt good to be off the horse. I moved slowly, still in the noisy pants, thinking them good discipline for making me slow down. Go slow enough to prevent nylon noise, and you're moving at a good still-hunting pace. There were plenty of dark pellets sprinkled among clumps of lichens. Moose were about. A willow ahead was mangled, and beneath it lay shrouds of antler velvet, still soft. A bull had been stripping here recently, but was it a moose or a caribou? I scanned the stunted taiga forest, glassed the far edges, and eased forward, shivering as the evening cool descended. A band of caribou forged on a bench below, two bulls working slowly toward spruce timber. Above and beyond them, the forest closed in, dark and solid, though no tree was taller than twenty feet. A thousand moose could have been hiding in there, but I only saw one, my bull. I was slowly sweeping the trees with my binocular when a black nose followed by wide white palms stepped from behind a spruce and stopped. Hello, moose. Nice hat. Stepping out for your evening meal, I presume? But no, the bull walked forward exactly one body length, turned around, and lay down. Plunk. Just like that. What? Stryker asked when he reached me. I've got a bull. I lined Stryker to the target as best I could. It took him a minute to find it. All you could see was the left palm and its nose when it turned just so. What do you think? Is he big enough? Maybe. Maybe. Let's get closer. Again, Clint was left to control the horses. Being a wrangler must be hard. We moved forward quickly. It would be dark in two hours. The bull was about a half mile away. Walking within range should be easy, then we'd see about its size. But as you already know, things did not work that way. The landscape dipped more than we'd anticipated, and we lost our quarry. I hesitated as Stryker started back to the horses, and when we looked back to see if I was following, he saw the moose. The stock resumed. We were within easy shooting distance. I was carrying a Rifles Inc. Strata Stainless Bolt Action in 280 Ackley Improved, which is a blown out 280 Remington case with a 40 degree shoulder. Lex Webernick built it, and he tailored handloads for it that tossed three 150 grain Barnes X bullets at 3,100 feet per second, and they landed inside of a half inch at 100 yards. Essentially, I was shooting a 7 mm Remington Magnum without the belt. The rifle, an easy carrying five and a half pounds with the scope aboard, had done the one-shot number on the sheep at 300 yards, so I wasn't too worried about missing a moose at less than 200 yards. Nevertheless, we crept closer. The bull was down in a hollow, and Stryker wanted a better look at those antlers. Besides, closer is always better with a big animal and a light bullet. Well, I had to go slowly. Those pants. One agonizing step at a time like a cat, weaving around willow and birch branches, keeping the muzzle up, the hasty sling tight around my left arm, ready to shoot fast, hoping to shoot deliberately, watching ahead should the bull break for the trees, watching below for branches underfoot. We could not see him just 100 yards away, but the ground rose between us. We had to reach the crest of that rise, and that would practically put us within bow range. The wind was quartering from our right and slightly behind. If it shifted, he would be up and running. I wiped my hands on my jacket, first the right, then the left. 
Leaves crunched underfoot. I froze. Stryker froze. We stared ahead. I imagined his eyes were darting side to side. He looked back at me. Okay. Another step. I can hear my heart. I'm breathing too hard. A stick snaps. Still, no moose. Another step. Stryker rises on his tiptoes. Suddenly ducks. Looks back. He's there. He mouths silently. He waves me forward. One step. Two. Three. I move ahead of Stryker and I stand erect. The bull is still bedded, facing away less than 70 yards. But all I see is head and the left palm, which is broad. We could creep closer, but why risk it? I put my mouth to Stryker's ear and I barely whisper, Big enough for you? Stryker nods affirmative. Me too. Okay, I'm going to take him. Make him stand up. The young woodsman grins, knowing, and he cups his hands to his mouth. I raise the rifle and I watch the mass of antlers sway with the bull's breathing. <coughs> Stryker says in a perfect imitation of a bull's grunting. A mighty palm turns left like a sail. Ears flick back, but the bull remains in its bed. <coughs> Stryker, Stryker groans, and he, he's getting louder. With a mighty heave, the bull stood, black, big, bulking. I take a raking shot behind the left rib cage, angling toward the off shoulder. The bull humps its back of the shot, then stands, begins to sway, coughs. Shoot him again, Stryker whispers. He's dead, just let him fall, I whisper back. I've seen too many recover and run. Better be safe. Shoot again. My only target is the rump. I wait. When the bull turns slightly to the right, I try to slip another X bullet into the ribs. But the angle is too shallow. That bullet glances off. The moose lies down. We wait for it to expire. But then, as I'm digging through the lichens and mosses for my empty cases, it leaps up and trots 20 yards. There he goes. Shoot him. I put the third shot in the left shoulder and the mighty bull fell dead. It's 7.30 p.m. Supper will be late. Clint rides up leading the horses and we fall to butchering, skinning from the top down as it lies, then carving the meat free from the skeleton. Stryker works quickly, smoothly. This is a sizable animal. The antler stretch 57 inches and the body is as long as a full-size Buick. I cut off lower leg bones that weigh as much as the white tail's hams. Clint and Stryker lift a front shoulder while I slice it free, then they lay it over birch branches to cool. In silver moonlight, Stryker heaves the meat-laden panniers onto the horses, ties the antlers on, and we turn toward camp. Halfway there, near midnight, we, a one load slips and a horse must be repacked. Then we plunge down a steep slope and turn beside a noisy creek. Finally, at 12.30 a.m., the cabin roof shows through the willows. Now the little potbelly stove is warming and the Coleman hissing. Hot cocoa, apple juice, bread, potatoes, sausage, beans, fruit. The cabin is well stocked and we are well fed. Tomorrow we repack for the scenic ride back to main camp. I'll eat moose all winter and remember. <laughs> yeah, I do remember. I thought we were not going to find that moose again, but I just could not imagine that being bedded and, and seeing him bed, that he would have gotten up. And if he had, we surely would have heard him or seen him run or something. But when Stryker looked back as we were returning to the horses and he saw that bull again, I think all we had really done was come out of that bottom far enough and probably move some trees out of our line of sight or something that were covering him up because he hadn't moved a bit, still right there. Which really goes to show when you're hunting anything and you're stalking, that patience and caution really pays off. And don't give up. You just have to assume that the animal is still there. If you have no solid indication that he's left, stick it out. Change your angle and, and look from another direction. You're going to find him. Now, if you are interested in a moose hunt, boy, I definitely recommend giving it a try. This, to me, is kind of the ultimate North American, North Woods game animal. And hunting them, you know, it's not a lot different than hunting elk or anything up in the North Woods, except for the moose. It's the moose, the world's biggest deer. And it has such a history and heritage. 
I, I can't help but think of Teddy Roosevelt and all this. What do you always say? As tough as a bull moose or as strong as a bull moose? The bull moose party. I mean, even pull the moose into politics. <laughs> so uh, it's just a heck of an animal. So if you want to get a full experience as being a North American hunter, I think you really need to try a moose hunt. So uh, look them up right now. Outfitted hunts are really expensive. I'm seeing costs of $20,000 for a North Country moose hunt. And part of the reason is that there's only so many tags available, only so many moose. But I think the other other reason is just the uh, getting there. It's just so expensive to get up into moose country. Sure, you can hunt along the roads and you can paddle some rivers and things. But even then, you've got to get pretty far up and then you've got to get picked up. And if you're going into a fly-in camp, you've got all that gear and the cost of flying in is high and it, it's a big deal. But it is absolutely wonderful. and. My my wife, she is hot to get a moose. She tried one time up in uh, the wilds of Alberta and didn't quite get the shot off in time before that moose stepped into the trees. And ever since, she has just wanted to get another moose hunt. So I think if my next moose hunt is going to be another guiding for Betsy hunt, um, she's trying to draw a tag for around here, which isn't easy. But a friend of mine, his wife put in for a tag last year and drew it and got a bull moose. and butchered it and packed it out all by herself. He was there with her, but she insisted this was her only bull she was ever going to get in Idaho. It's one tag per lifetime. And by golly, she was going to get the full experience. And she did. I saw pictures of her packing out that that big old moose. It was uh, obviously a big chore because that's a big, big animal. So uh, make sure you have plenty of sharp knives. If you go and get your moose, you're going to be spending a good half day cutting him up and probably another half day packing him out. Hey, this is Ron Spomer. Thanks for listening. Uh, Tune in again on RSO Podcast. We will uh, be answering questions, and we're going to pretty soon start interviewing some folks in the industry. And from now now and then, I will read these adventure articles when I come across them, dig through the old files. It's always fun to revisit the old days. Oh, by the way, that uh, 280 AI is proving itself time and time again, and that rifle is still ticking. I just got to keep uh, getting myself out there so I can use it. Hey, thanks for listening. This is Ron Spomer, Hunt Honest, and shoot straight.